the call a meeting to order. Hi, everybody. All board members present. Um, we're going to do the national anthem next. So if y'all will all stand and welcome Camp Ernst Middle School. <laughs> All right, if everybody wants to remain standing for the Pledge of the Flag led by the students of Long Branch Elementary.
All right. That was awesome. It's always good to see the kids come through. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mr. McCarter for the good news items. Thank you, Mr. Parks. I would like to introduce the March Break the Mold winner. Congratulations to Camp Ernst Middle School Social Studies teacher, Philip Jordan. In a letter of nomination written by his principal, Ms. Steph Stephanie Haggerty, she said, in the dynamic landscape of education, there are those who not only teach, but inspire, guide, and foster community. Mr. Jordan's dedication transcends the confines of traditional teaching as he consistently goes above and beyond to ensure his students grasp not just the content, but the deeper significance of societal dynamics. Let's take a peek inside his classroom and see what it looks like. A great teacher is one who can take the very subject you hate the most and turn it into the one you love. But when he goes to Switzerland, people are starting to listen to his ideas and think, hey, we agree with you. He's funny and he makes the sound really fun. Right now we're learning about the Protestants Reformation and King Henry VIII and his assignments are just, again, really fun. It's very interesting. I love the way he teaches it. Um, He'll give us assignments and I'll do things that kind of bring us to that event in history. He's got a lot of energy. The kids love it. He engages them. He holds them accountable. I've seen some of the toughest kids uh, doing whatever they are supposed to be doing. He holds them to high expectations. These are six different theses. They're written in the 1500s. Philip Jordan is a seventh grade social studies teacher at Camp Ernst Middle School. To be in Mr. Philip Jordan's classroom is to feel like you've stepped into a history timeline. His classroom is designed for comfort and engagement. We go history from uh, medieval times all the way to the modern age. And in that, we are all over we're in Asia, Europe, um, Africa. And there's just a lot of religions. So we uh, talk about four or five different religions throughout the school year. We are taught that polite conversation should avoid religion and politics. But Mr. Jordan can do this without teaching belief systems or politics, just the facts. I make sure they know, like, hey, this is from the year 700. We were talking about the year 700. We're never talking about 2024. Um, I said that right away. He works so hard and is very intentional with his lesson planning to make it engaging and something that the kids are going to remember and learn from. To be in his classroom, you can easily forget your place. We were guests. However, his style of teaching was so engaging it made us feel like we were his students. From my perspective as a, as a school counselor, I just see how kids are so comfortable in his class. He makes his classroom so inviting and so just kids know they're safe in there. They know they're emotionally safe in there. They know that they're okay to take risks educationally. We asked Mr. Jordan where he learned his teaching style that makes learning so easy in his classroom. I had good teachers. I had bad teachers. I think it gave me a passion when I had good teachers who I respected and it gave me more passion when teachers I did not respect. Mr. Jordan has been teaching for 12 years. There was a time when he thought seriously about leaving the profession. During COVID, it was really hard. Uh, Mr. Jordan was trying to find out what it is exactly he wanted to do. Um, there was a lot of changes, and with that, um, there were some struggles, and I had some other ideas um, that I was looking into. I did not try to convince him to stay in education because I knew that in the end that, that would really be a disservice to our students, to himself, and I thought he needed to kind of go down that journey on his own. Even in like the hardest of the years, there were like students who would just come up and say like the impact that I've had and what I do. And I wanted to walk, but then I just felt like there's no way I could. And we're so glad you didn't, Mr. Jordan. What a loss that would be. Mr. Jordan doesn't just teach social studies. He wants his students to have a well-rounded outlook on culture and life. He's the drama coach at Camp Burns Middle School, putting on two to three plays a year. I've got to run! And takes his students on field trips. This year, he's bringing back the Chicago trip. I never went seven years ago, but somewhere the trip just stopped, and I just didn't like the kids not having an option. Um, so I'm taking the 7th and 8th graders to Chicago in March just to give them that thing. We're going to go to a lot of science and history museums um, just to get them out of Burlington, Kentucky, let them see the world a little bit. You can see, see a lot of different teachers do things for different reasons. Sometimes they love the content, sometimes they love the time, um, the schedule, whatever it is. He loves the kids, and that's the kind of teacher we want in our classrooms. Congratulations, Mr. Jordan. We love you. Congratulations, Mr. Jordan. You deserve this. 
Mr. Jordan, I am so proud of you and so happy that you have won the Break the Morning Award. You truly deserve it. Congratulations, Mr. Jordan. Our school is full of energy and passion because of you, and we are so lucky to have you. like to come up front and make a speech in the, I think everybody, everybody's dying to hear a speech. Okay. sat right back down. So. <laughs> okay, our next good news item is the Life Changer of the Year Award. Congratulations to Burlington Elementary second grade teacher, Christina King, who has been nominated for the National Group's Life Changer of the Year Award. This award recognizes and rewards the very best K through 12 educators and school district employees across the United States who are making a difference in the lives of students by exemplifying excellence, positive influence, and leadership. Ms. King was nominated by the parent of a student, Tracy Harney, for a long-lasting impact she has had on Ms. Harney's two children. Christina has truly been an amazing teacher to my children and myself. She is willing to help with anything I need and truly is an angel sent from heaven in today's world, said Harney. Each school year, Life Changer of the Year re receives hundreds of nominations from all 50 states and the District of Columbia. 17 individual Life Changer of the Year awards will be given this school year. Congratulations, Christina, on your nomination. And Christina, you can come up. We uh, absolutely have some of the best people in Boone County schools. That's absolutely the case. And thank you all. All right. Um, looks like next up is our student board member representative report. All right. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Um, well, it is March, so thank you all for coming here. Less than a month till spring break, so I hope we're all waiting for that. Um, so first off, I want to congratulate uh, the Mental Health Task Force of Boone County for organizing the Mental Health Summit. Uh, myself and a few other students went to this event and I can tell you it was amazing. Um, the sessions were very uh, wonderful. The guest speakers, the keynote speakers did a great job of exemplifying what the, what the struggles of mental health are and how we can best tackle those. I know that uh, from the student perspective, we had two RAL uh, high schoolers uh, present sessions there and they did a phenomenal job. I couldn't be more prouder of them and what they accomplished there uh, presenting in front of adults, uh, teachers, 
uh, parents and, you know, even middle schoolers who attended. So congratulations to all involved in the Mental Health Summit. Uh, personally, uh, you know, through the, going through the school year, we just took the ACT as a junior this Tuesday, which was not really fun. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. Let's, let's hope for some good results across, across this district. Uh, and then I uh, got contacted by the Kentucky Student Voice Team to write a statement about HB 381, which involves uh, a possible bill that could enforce student representatives on every board of education. And so I really hope that our lawmakers uh, in this state are able to pass this and make sure that, you know, as in my my opinion and my experiences on this uh, Board of Education, they have been incredibly eye-opening to what happens behind the scenes and how a district fully functions, which you really don't understand as a regular student who does not, you know, attend these meetings and meet the people that you're able to meet. So I hope a lot of districts ac across the state are able to get that advantage and that perspective if this bill were to pass. This past Monday, myself and another a member of the Superintendent Student Advisory Council, Autumn Barker, we were able to go with Mr. Turner to the Rotary Club and present about what SSAC truly is. Uh, it was a great experience as well that w just really opened the doors of how the Rotary Club and the students of this district are able to, you know, interconnect and more jointly work together and, you know, different service events and whatever the Rotary Club is up to. And so I hope that proves beneficial for us in the future. Talking about the Superintendent Student Advisory Council, uh, this past um, Wednesday, we were able to talk over the delegate assembly. Unfortunately, my term here on this board is coming to an end this year. And so we began the session by having Mr. Vocal, who is the AP uh, politics and government teacher over at Cooper High School, talk to all of our students about the important the important process that is voting and how the democratic ideals of our country are all embedded into what the Superintendent Student Advisory Council truly is. Uh, we began the sessions with a lot more communication. We talked about, you know, what we want to find in the next student representative and the candidates and campaigns are starting this month and will uh, be voted on in the next meeting next month. Uh, there was no members of the month this month because I felt that our, our focus is on SSAC were to find out the next student and we were all very involved and we were all very vocal and so I didn't want to pinpoint someone who was exemplar because we, we were all exemplar. Every single student on that board, um, on that council did a great job last meeting. Uh, that is all I have for today. Uh, I hope to talk to you all next month and keep you updated with what happens on the student end. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the report, and I, I'm say for the speak for the people up here. We're big fans of your reports. We always look for it. At least I do. I'm, I'm pretty sure they feel the same way. All right, uh, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, and turn the meeting over to Mr. McCarter for that report. Thank you, Mr. Parks. I'd like to invite Dr. Detweiler up to give the academic portion of the district's report for this month. Thank you, Mr. McCarter. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, we're going to spotlight some of the work that our math consultant, Kelly Stidham, has been doing with teachers around the district in math lesson studies. So I'll bring Kelly Stidham to the microphone. We could probably go even lower, actually. <laughs> Hello. I hope you're having a great evening. As uh, Dr. Dottweiler said, my name is Kelly Stidham. I'm the math consultant uh, with LSS. And I am lucky enough to serve all of the schools in our district and work with a lot of the teachers and students. Recently, um, as of uh, the end of last year and going into this year, we've added a new professional learning structure to the work that we do with teachers across the board. It's called lesson research. And it's a process that gives uh, teachers the, dr the um, control over what they're learning, but also is teacher driven with student data. So I have a handout for you that summarizes the process. I'm gonna bring it up and then I'll tell you a little bit about what it looks like in our schools. So as I said, uh, this process is called lesson study. It fits in with the pattern of professional learning that we provide for teachers uh, in other forms as well. So as you know, we provide a lot of professional learning through workshops, book studies, um, going to conferences. These are all ways that we help our teachers build knowledge. We also have a really rigorous coaching model that helps our teachers take that new knowledge and enact it in their classrooms, whether that be from an instructional coach 
or with peers in their own building. That's really important because that takes that knowledge and builds practice. But lesson study helps us build expertise in how that practice impacts the students that are actually in our own classroom. So um, that's what we're working on, is building expertise. You can see in the outline, oh, thank you. You can see in the outline there that it is not a quick process. It actually takes um, a course of several weeks across the course of the year. <coughs> And it is worth the time because we're answering research themes like this one. We're not asking technical questions like how do I use IC or what does a specific standard mean. We're addressing big questions that take a lot of time but that are really important for our students and for our teachers. For example, this one. If our goal is to have more student-to-student -student mathematical discussion, then our teachers might say, we're gonna do some research around that, and we believe if we use teaching through problem solving, then we might get to use a novel new problem, which means we'll get more diverse student ideas, and if we have more diverse student ideas, then the kids will have something more meaningful to talk about and more reasoning to share. So their research theme might be, uh, as you see there, we aim to increase the level of student-to-student -student talking through teaching through problem solving. Once they have that theme, then teachers uh, study that topic through research. So they might use uh, research that's been done in universities, in other countries. They might look at the progressions of standards. Then they also will use that research to write a specific lesson plan. And this is really important because I can learn a lot of things, but until I put it in practice in my day-to-day -day life, it's hard to know what that's really gonna look like and how it's gonna come out. So they do a lot of research and they study. They create a very detailed lesson plan all together. One teacher then teaches that lesson plan while the others observe and watch specific students to see how their research is playing out with the real life students that are in our Boone County classrooms. After that, the group reflects all together to talk about what they've learned and how that's gonna impact not that one lesson, but every lesson every day. And then they report out, so it's not just this team who gets to benefit from the learning, but all the teams around them and across our district. As I said, this does take quite a bit of time. Um, usually five, across five to six weeks, they'll spend many hours studying and planning. In the course of one day, they'll teach and reflect. And then they'll take one or two hours to, to uh, collect all of their thoughts and report it out. It's important that this takes time, again, because we're answering questions that are big questions that are important for all of our teachers. Here are some of the um, inputs and outputs. During the study and plan phase, as I said, teachers will build on existing research. They may reach out to other teams that have done similar work. And they'll also use a knowledgeable other, so someone from the outside who's giving them feedback on their thinking and their planning. Then during the teach and reflect phase, we collect data on how the students are doing in that lesson, but we also ask the students, how did that lesson work for you? What did it feel like when you were learning? What problems did you have that you felt like your teacher could have um, addressed more uh, effectively with you? And then also there's observers from the outside. So sometimes we make that lesson public and get um, folks to come who have never, weren't part of that lesson and maybe haven't been part of the work all along. So they have fresh eyes and can tell us things that maybe we miss having been part of the process all along. As I said before, it's not just this team who will benefit from the work, but also during the report phase, the observers who come to that lesson learn from the team and their students. Other teams will study their findings and it should all build up towards a school theme. So for example, we've been doing this work this year at Yaley Elementary. They actually um, have a school-wide theme, students talking and writing about their reasoning, specifically in mathematics. The school developed this by the teachers all getting together at the end of the last year and saying, what do we need to learn how to do for our students to better understand mathematics and perform more strongly in mathematics? This also connected to their POG goal of students communicating 
um, through that enduring skill. So it's really important to them. But it's also not something we can go to one workshop and check it off the list. It's something that has lots of dimensions and is war it warrants a lot of study. So here are some of the things that the teacher said they learned through that process. I won't read these specifically to you, but these are quotes straight from the teachers, and I think what's so powerful about them is that the teachers themselves were able to say, this was the specific goal our, our school needed. We have created new knowledge ourselves around what works in Boone County, and they were able to um, have very specific takeaways about how their practice was going to change every day in the future in some very, very important ways. Um, one teacher reflected on how um, an action and lesson study specifically anticipating student responses has made their PLC stronger, made the work of their PLC stronger. Another teacher talked specifically about a lesson structure that now they use every day and are seeing great results in their rooms. And then the third teacher talked a lot about <clears throat> how they might use their time differently as a team. Having dedicated time to research and discuss was hugely um, informative for them. Really great results. So in Boone County, some possible outcomes as we grow this work, it doesn't have to be about mathematics, although that is the most important. Um, these, this process can be used to study uh, any of those big questions that we're trying to get after. So we might use this process to think about how we implement inquiry-based learning or teaching through problem solving. We might uh, use this process to think about how we support teachers in designing effective instruction for every student. So how, are, uh, how is our instruction meeting the needs of EL or SPED students? Uh, we might use this to help us answer those big questions about how we move towards deeper learning and a portrait of a graduate. But most importantly, and I think this is the most exciting part, is that it opens up our learning community as a staff to build our collective efficacy um, for all of the students here in Boone County Schools. A few next steps. We need to uh, continue to partner with Lesson Study Alliance, Lesson Study Group, and Impulse. Those are three groups who have really the experts in our country around lesson study. Impulse is a group that works directly with folks in Japan. Um, but they come uh, basically free to us, but they're a great resource, especially in helping us facilitate learning study as we learn more about it, and providing knowledgeable others, and providing final commenters for the uh, observed lessons. We also want to expand our own capacity in leading the work, and we want to um, build some specific ways that we're going to showcase the learning of teams across our district. So that's it. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Sounds great. If you want to do math, I'll be in the back. Otherwise, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Yeah. You think she's joking. She's not. I was fortunate to be able to watch one of those lesson studies, these one of those observers, and it was so awesome to be able to see teachers really energize as researchers in the classroom. It was awesome. So thank you, Pally, for that. I have just one more announcement. Uh, Mr. McCarter and I, this coming next two weeks, will be starting our work study groups for the strategic plan. Um, we'll be focusing on benefits-based and community-based accountability to find out how our community wants to measure that strategic plan so we can update you um, next month on how it goes. That completes our report. Thank you, Dr. Detweiler. I would now like to invite uh, our Assistant Superintendent of Operations, Ms. Best, to come up and give the operations report. Thank you, Mr. McCarter. Wow, I feel tall at this. Thanks, Kelly. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to give a quick update for some operations areas, as well as have Mr. Ball come up and um, share some HR updates for you. So the first thing I'll start with is a construction update. So obviously you've probably seen on the agenda tonight, we have several um, projects that will be starting based on some of the consent agenda items. Those are a lot of our annual projects, such as paving, plumbing, HVAC, as well as some other one-time projects that we'll see across the district at Kelly, Cooper, and obviously um, Yaley Elementary. We do have some active construction projects happening out at the Long Branch camp campus. So if you've been out there, you have seen the new greenhouse, which is an exciting thing for them to get. Um, and that is coming to a close, so that will be finishing up fairly quickly. 
as well as the mobiles that are out on the Long Branch property as well. So if you're out at Long Branch, you'll see some activity going on out there. We've also been very busy in facilities and maintenance, getting ready for some of those upcoming projects. We've had several events with pre-bidding, as well as bid openings that have occurred for the Connor Field House, Camp Ertz Middle School, and Ignite Institute renovation for some additional classrooms. So we'll start seeing some more action on the consent agenda for those as well. For transportation, um, just a quick update. So we have um, some exciting things going on there as well. So I wanted to um, recognize Mr. Greer for some work that he's been doing to recognize his staff members and some perfect attendance that we have out there. So as you're all well aware, you know we continue to have some unfilled routes, some vacant routes, um, which does present a challenge. But in addition to that, also when we have drivers that are absent, that just increases that number of double routes. So Mr. Greer and, if t and his team have been working to recognize those staff members with perfect attendance. And in the month of February, we had 119 drivers and aides who had perfect attendance. So that is something really to be recognized because obviously anytime we're missing a driver, that does create some additional work um, for the other. So great job on that to Mr. Greer for recognizing. Um, just some current status with where we are with our staffing. So we currently have three drivers in various training stages. We've had two part-time retirees that have returned and are back on the road. So that's exciting to see our drivers that have left and realize how much they missed us and now they're back. So that's great to see as well. Um, in the month of February and March, we have received eight applications. And as we know, this is kind of that time of year where we start to kind of dwindle down with hiring. But of course, that'll ramp back up once the school year comes to an end and summer begins. Um, HR is currently working with transportation on some spring and summer events, um, such as our third annual open house. And we also participate in the touch a truck event with um, the county. So that's a really exciting event that we have a lot of people come out and be able to explore things. Another hiring event that our transportation department participated in was kindergarten registration. So as you know, whenever our tiny people come to their first event at the schools, we try to have a bus there for them so that they have that opportunity to go on the bus, to see the bus, to talk to some bus drivers. So our bus drivers were great and they handed out a lot of recruitment flyers to those families who came to kindergarten registration. So transportation's really working to make sure that we are interacting with as many parents and as many different av avenues as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ball's gonna update us on HR. Good evening. I apologize. This is at Miss uh, Stidham Height, so I'm going to try to work with it here. Uh, thank you for your time again this evening. Uh, I did want to give uh, an HR update uh, in support of our empowered workforce. Just as a reminder, this is the time of year we're starting to post positions. So if you're seeing numbers that are larger than they were last month, it's because we have allocations, vacancies, those things coming in. It's not because we have people flocking out of the district at the end of the year. This is a completely natural thing to happen, uh, having uh, some of those positions increase. And we're already starting to post those because the best thing we can do is get those positions out there early because then we have the largest pool of candidates to choose from. So I'll go through my uh, monthly list for you guys and then uh, tell you a little bit about our recruitment efforts. So we currently have eight uh, regular education teacher positions open. We have one school psychologist uh, position open, which is down from two, and I only point that out because it is so exceptionally difficult to find a school psychologist right now. Um, so Kathy and her team finding a school psychologist is fabulous. So we still are looking for one of those positions. Seven special education teachers, three uh, paraeducators, instructional paraeducators, eight special education paraeducators, 12 I'm sorry, I, my, my, I knew I was going a little too fast, I, my apologies. Three paraeducators, eight special education paraeducators, 12 custodians, although we've got a couple in the pipeline there, um, so that number is quickly going to uh, decrease there. One staff support, five cafeteria workers, and two maintenance workers. So that is an increase in the total number of positions from last month, but again, as I explained, that's to, to be expected. Um, of all the hiring events and career fairs we've been attending, I've already told you about some of them. We do have one this month at Xavier University. That tends to be a really, really big one. And although it's on the other side of the river, we have a lot of folks um, that we can absolutely recruit from there. Uh, that's one of the more well-attended 
education career fairs. They hold it at uh, the CentOS Center, right there on, on adjacent to the campus or on the campus. Um, so we get a really, really good turnout there. So Megan Mintz will be uh, there as well as uh, try to get some other people to go with her. Uh, and then the alternative path to certification open house, uh, that is March 21st right here at Ralph Rush from five to seven. Uh, we always have a, a really exciting time because those are folks that are looking for a way to engage in the profession. And so we have uh, an opportunity to meet them and they have an opportunity to meet right at that time with local universities that provide alternative paths to certification. Uh, and we also are looking at other regional career fairs because not only do we need to look at our certified career fairs, but we're also making those efforts to look at those career fairs uh, where we can engage individuals uh, in our classified positions. And then we haven't solidified the date. We're hoping at Boone County High School will be the location for our um, employment fair uh, that we're going to, to do towards the end of this year. That's the one we typically do right before school starts as well. It's the one where we had roughly 100 people attend. Um, so we're looking to do that again this year, both at the beginning of the hiring season and towards the end. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Best. Thank you, Mr. Ball. And Mr. Parks, that concludes our superintendent's report. All right. Um, looks like we're going to move to item seven, which is the audience of the citizens. Uh, this <clears throat> the board welcomes the opportunity to hear from the community and inform the board of your views on matters before the board. Please keep in mind, the Board of Education agenda is set and by statute, the board can only discuss the items that are present on the agenda. The board cannot legally nor would the board discuss a specific issue to an employee or a student in respect to privacy. Reminder. These meetings are streamed live on YouTube. Please be respectful in your comments. If you have a concern that you'd like a response from the administration, feel free to leave your information as directed. Keep the comments to two minutes so that all wish to speak may speak. And remember, don't yield your time. If you have a longer message than two minutes, have someone else say it for you. Looks like we're gonna have, uh, hey, Antonio Smith Rouse, 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 Rouse got it. So just to be sh clear, even though there's a short number and he was going to yield his time to me, he can't. Huh? He doesn't know my message. <laughs> <laughs> and I, this I've not started yet. So can he yield his time since I think we're the only two on the list? You watch these meetings quite often, don't you? Yes. So you know I've been saying this since the beginning of the year. But I don't think we were ever given warning that yielding was officially going to stop at this meeting. All right, so, well, since there's only three people signed up, unless everyone else here wants to speak, <laughs> um, have at it, but please, next time. Okay. All right. My name is Antoine Smith-Rouse. Um, I have uh, children across several um, schools here in Boone County. Um, I also sit on the site-based decision-making council. My ask to the board is that we stop using inclusivity as a buzzword and actually start being inclusive here in our district. Um, as many of you all know, we are searching for a superintendent at the time, which requires a search, to be, a search committee to be formed by KRS. Um, since a minority was not organically chosen through the initial search, um, there has to be a special called election um, for said minority parent representative representative. Um, during that process, it has very much been treated as an afterthought and not a priority um, at hand. Um, the individuals were sent out an all call, were told to leave a voicemail. There was no communication that they were eligible to run until the day before. So um, the day of when the election was supposed to take place was um, yesterday. We received an email at 8 a.m. on Tuesday letting us know that we were expected to come and speak here at this building at 6 p.m. Um, on Thursday and that the vote was going to take place um, in person and that there was going to be no outside voting allowed to take place. Um, when you look at disproportionalities and um, who has lack of transportation and who has lacks of lo uh, lack of flexibility due to the type of jobs they are required to have, um, that disproportionately affects minorities many of the time. So I was rather perplexed as to why we are requiring an um, in-person vote, and I was told 
basically that it was due to limit the number of votes because there just wasn't the bandwidth to count every single vote from every single Boone County parent. Um, so I kind of took issue with that, but that is what I was told. So we made sure the individuals were gonna be here um, and able um, to vote. I then asked, um, since it was gonna be an in-person vote, how they were going to um, make sure that the individuals that were coming to vote were indeed Boone County parents, and I was told that it was gonna be taken on good faith. Uh, again, treated like an afterthought. That's not even the same burden that our schools are required to have whenever they have their site-based decision-making um, votes. They have to actually um, take ID and verify that. Um, so then we came, um, the vote was um, to take place. We were thrilled to have um, nine minorities show up, which just take a moment and think about how great that is when we think about the lack of uh, minorities um, that we sometimes have run on our site bases. Um, after viewing the ballot, um, I um, questioned the eligibility of someone um, of someone's minority status based on the strict definition that is in the KRS, and I was told yet again that that was not gonna be vetted or verified, and again, just gonna be taken on good faith. Once again, treated like an afterthought. Um, then the vote took place. Um, there was not very many people in attendance because there, it was not very well um, um, broadcasted. Um, in my opinion, if you actually look at the KRS, it states that um, parents were supposed to get adequate notice of the time, place, vote, and purpose of the vote, and I do not think that the district met that um, requirement under KRS. Um, after, um, but when we were when we were told how the vote was going to take place, um, I asked. I said, "There is a limited number of people here. Since there's such little people, and it's an in-person vote, can we please um, just know the results tonight?" I was told that there were other individuals who had voted um, that were not in attendance and they would have to be able to take those um, into consideration. I asked about that because I said I was specifically told it was an in-person vote only and I was told that they made an exception for some people but that was not widely communicated. So not ever, so some people were allowed to vote um, not showing in person while others weren't. Um, today they have attempted to rectify that situation. Again, an afterthought, we were supposed to have the results today and we do not have the results and we are told that we can now submit bios by 9 a.m. tomorrow. We received that communication at about 2 p.m., less than 24 hours. How many people don't have access to their email all the time and aren't going to submit that? Once again, treated like an afterthought. When we look at just everything, we say that we want to be an inclusive district and we're treating inclusivity as an afterthought. And I really would like the board to research why is that happening and I will submit my information for a response. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mole? I, yeah, I can. We're going to follow the rules on that part. Cool. <laughs> hey, would you do me a favor and leave your contact information with Mr. Ball for me? Thank you. Um, Chris Baverse. How do you say your last name? It's part of the yellow, means the yellow right. Pavese. The Pavese. There we go. All right, got it. Nice to meet y'all. Chris Pavese. I am a Boone County resident. Do have kids in the school district. Um, I'm going to keep this on a light note. Nice to meet y'all. Um, Yusuf, awesome job on Monday presenting at the Rotary. Keep it up. I did find out Yusuf is uh, uh, interested in engineering, licensed professional engineer. Um, I did ask Matt if I could take him to our engineering luncheon today. He said he missed too much school. So sorry, Yusuf. Maybe <laughs> next time. Um, I did, like I said, I did have an opportunity to uh, talk to our um, our. Sorry, superintendent, don't want to mis mispronounce his title, um, at Ryle, got a, a campus tour, very nice school, um, got to see some of the other schools in the area. Um, I have a sixth grader, so I haven't seen the high school yet. My wife graduated there from a long time ago with uh, Maria, and the school has changed. E even uh, my wife didn't recognize some of the changes that had gone on. I think they're on their second, um, second remodel or whatever, second edition since you all graduated. Um, running for state representative 60th district and I'll leave you on one more highlight since we were doing highlights earlier with bus drivers my daughter loved our bus driver last before he retired and she absolutely loves her bus driver Tammy thank you I'll yield the rest of my time it wasn't that long ago gosh <laughs> Um, that's all the people that signed up. Are there any other people that might have missed the sign-up sheet that would like to speak tonight? Do we? Any students want to speak? No? 
You sure? Do they have to give their name out loud? Yeah, Got to come up and say your name and what school you go to. And what's your stud and what your major is, right, or something like that? Yeah, studying. Okay. After you say your name and, and various other things, go ahead and uh, sign the sheet over there. name, where I'm studying, what I'm studying for. Okay. My name is Megan Mayles. I'm studying at NKU for elementary education. Nice. My name is Allie Gaybauer, and I go to NKU for elementary education. And my high school I went to was Bishop Brossard. Nice. My name is Kelly Greeley. I'm going to Gateway into NKU later, and I'm studying elementary education, and I went to Bishop Rossett High School as well. Hello. Timothy Taylor, University of the Cumberlands, Master of Arts in Teaching for Special Education. Uh, my name is Caleb Griffin. I go to Gateway, and currently I'm studying just education in general. Not nothing really big yet, just it right across the line. Got it. So this is Juan Sayed. I study at Randall K. Cooper High School. I have not yet declared a major and I have come for content for my essay and I would like to thank you very much for being a gold mine for my, my essay content. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Miles Gilson. I'm from Randall K. Cooper and I'm a 12th grader. I don't know what I'm going to study in college yet. Uh, my name is Adam Klein. I'm studying secondary education at Northern Kentucky University, and I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you. My name's Kennedy Manning, and I go to Gateway, and I'm studying early childhood education, and I graduated from Williamstown Independent. Thank you. I hope you guys all end up working here. I just want to tell you that. Every one of you. All right. <clears throat> we'll move on to item eight. Um, recommended action consent items A through QQ. Mr. McCarter. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. I recommend the board to approve the recommended action consent agent items N -N. A through NN as presented with the treasurer's report given by Mrs. Linda Shield. Okay, thank you. Um, we began the month with a beginning cash balance of $93,326,107. Our total receipts for the month were $7,359,899. Our expenditures were $13,000,000. $718,325. We had a net decrease in the cash balance this month of $6,358,426. Um, that le leaves us with a cash balance of $86,967,681. Our um, financial activity this month was very routine, so there's not much to report. Um, however, we did collect 600000 in omitted taxes, um, and the total collected so far this year is 932000 uh, And again, I continue to report that our operating expenditures are trending consistently with uh, the prior year and according to our budgeted um, plans. Our debt service for the month was $5.1 million. I've provided um, the uh, usual comparative uh, analysis, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, do I have a <coughs> motion to approve the consent agenda items A through double N as recommended? So moved. Second. Okay. 
uh, Karen Bird and Dr. Brown. Have any discussion on the items on the consent agenda? Item HH for the the contract or the what's that's what um, Jones Middle School and, and the Ion Center. Um, the program. Um, is this the first time we've done that? It's MySpace program? Good evening. Hi. It is the first time that Jones has made this um, commitment with ION. Okay. Have, 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 we, have we reviewed it? Have you guys reviewed the program? Yes. Or? The only, my, my concern, and I'm trying to, I don't know why it was pulled up on here and I don't have it pulled up anymore, Are we, is, is a survey part. It says, I, I read in there that they would have access to survey the students. So the survey is more of a, a needs assessment with the students of where they're looking for areas that the students feel um, need more boundary support in the building so it's it's looking at spaces that are safe um, that the students feel super safe versus places they don't feel comfortable that maybe boundaries are being um, unhealthy whether it be by other students we talk about bullying a lot right um, in middle school that's a big topic so it's it's more around bullying and just space with individuals and um, that relationship piece okay does that make sense yeah, so it's not a survey just, like, well, uh, like I didn't an think SEL it, survey. I didn't think it was like anything that. like that. It no, just, it's just more don't know what kind of you know information they would be asking and that we're giving them about our kids. I just want to. No, it's it's more. I just want to make sure. How are my? I just want to ask the question so that way, if I'm ever asked. Relationships with adults and it's generally around the school building and uh, and around just their friendships and you know with their um, okay. circles. Does and you all sense? did review the program. I would. You, and yes. Okay. Yes. No. Okay. I've looked through. There's a whole curriculum that they provided. I would it's assume about, it's a great program. Yes. It's. it's I'm it's, super excited. It about sounded it great. I'm, I'm super not, excited I'm about not. it for the students because I think it'll give them a lot of foundations mm -hmm. um, that they deal with mm -hmm. um, on a general basis. And now with social media, it just right. kind of supports that healthy relationship. Right. right. I think it sounded great. I just wanted to clarify a few questions. So thank you very much. Is that all? Yeah. That was it. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. That was all I had. I'll just make a comment that I now know more about Edulog than I ever thought I wanted to know. <laughs> 143 page contract. Could we maybe get the abstract next time? <laughs> 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 Do we have cliff notes the next time? <laughs> well, when you think about how long we've needed this upgrade, it kind of is appropriate that it was that many pages. Um, I have a brief question on item JJ, the capital funds uh, use approval. I don't know who would be best to answer that exactly. Shields. Does, um, I know this was, this came about through um, a house bill that allowed us to use uh, capital funds for improvement projects within the facilities around the district. Mm -hmm. My question is, when a district does that or this district does something like that does that does that impact the future of like building a school or any big capital projects it it certainly could you know depending on the available funding but our funding is sufficient um, through the three nickels and the restrictions from the tax dollars that we collect um, so we wouldn't make the recommendation if we felt like we couldn't um, fund our future projects. 
So we felt like this was uh, in line. What this House bill does is allow us to cut out a lot of the red tape that was involved previously, as, but we are allowed to make the same decisions that they would um, you know, normally approve that would fall under uh, what we're allowed to spend capital funds on. So we can just make it, we can make it happen faster. And because there now is a lack of a, um, a established or um, approval process, you know, there typically when we uh, spend money through capital funds, it's a project that involves a BG, and that's then the traditional approval process that the the board will have in front of them. Um, this type of spending is absent a BG one, so that's why we're presenting it to the board via a, a memo, so that they are aware, um, you know, or see the recommendation that we'd like to use the funds in that way. <clears throat> were the projects identified um, part of a, a facilities plan? Were they uh, scheduled to already be done, or were these identified recently? Um, I think I can keep going. Okay, sure. <laughs> so for the two um, playground projects that are listed on there, one of um, the things we've been working on with our strategic plan work is around um, kind of streamlining some processes. So traditionally, we have um, planned playgrounds kind of on an as-needed basis. And what we have been doing is looking uh, with our facilities department and creating a replacement cycle. So the two that are listed on this agreement um, are the first two that we've identified that needed a major replacement or a complete replacement. And our end goal would be to continue that process. So they have been in discussion for quite a while. And what this does also, as many of you are aware, a lot of times our schools do a lot of fundraising in order to replace those playgrounds. So this takes that responsibility from the school and allows us to provide those for them. Um, <clears throat> I guess my next question is, are, are there any... Um, in, in let's say the next two financial quarters, are there any more projects that we're going to use this type of maneuver to pay for? I know we do, yeah, <laughs> right. But none that'll like a playground where we use capital yeah, funds. Okay, got it. I believe there's an annual inspection that's done on all of our playgrounds, and these were identified um, as okay. the two. So there, I guess this summer, I can't remember exactly when those inspections occur. During the summer. And um, we'll probably uh, be discussing any others that are identified next year. Um, thank you. And I'll, I'll just say to my... Um, fellow board members that the concern wasn't that we didn't need the playground or anything like that but when um, I think the spirit of the house bill which we've honored is to upgrade our facilities by using this this uh, new language in the law that allows us to do that outside of the process but we want to make sure that we have we had, we do have a couple at least very large projects coming up mm -hmm. that we we probably will identify at some point officially um, and if we need to build a school here or add on to one of our other schools, we need to, uh, the only concern I have is that we don't use capital funds for things that might not be as big as projects as those other things. But it sounds like that's not a concern at the moment. Um, the last thing I'll say, not really a question, but I, I wanted to commend the Transportation Department um, for item LL, uh, which is the sale of the two buses to Perry County is that correct um, I if, if if you're super interested in school board stuff I always ask about where the buses go to be auctioned I've had asked that over the years I, I'm I huge proponent of this type of thing where a school district that may be able to use our surplus buses and maybe even other equipment end up with that I know some of these 
um, for smaller districts, these buses may have a lot more life. So I, I commend you for working that out and, um, you know, saving that school district some money and, you know, recouping some of our costs too. So it's, it's really good and um, uh, financially responsible, and I appreciate that. While remembering how hard Perry County was hit in the flood in eastern Kentucky. And I was down in that area not too long after that, and I've never seen such devastation. All right. Um, anybody else? All right. <clears throat> Being that there is no further discussion, we'll move forward with the vote. All in favor, please say yeah. Yeah. Yes. Five yeas, no nays. No, five yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, motion passes. All right. All right. Move on to item nine. Recommended old action. Seeing there's no old business on the agenda, we'll move on to item 10. Recommended action, new business item, Mr. McCarter. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. I recommend the board to approve the recommended action new business item A, instructional time for the 2024-2025 school year. Do I have a motion to approve the new business item A, instructional time for the 24-25 school year is recommended? Second. Okay. <laughs> we have a motion for... Young, and the second, I think, was uh, Wolf. Any discussion on item A? I'm a quiet group tonight. All right. Being there's no further discussion, we'll move forward with the vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Five, no nays. All right, motion passes with all aye votes or yay votes. Aye. Okay. Um, we vote what you tell us to. I, I, yeah, well, yeah. one says I, and the other one says yay. So what <laughs> you are. All right. Move on to uh, item 10. Let's see. Recommend a new I item B. I'm sorry, Mr. McCarter. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. I recommend the board to approve the recommended action new business item B, instructional time adjustment for elementary schools for the 2024-2025 school year. Do I have a motion to approve the new business item B, instructional time adjustment for elementary schools for the 24-25 school year as recommended? So moved. Second. I got Wolf and Bird. Any discussion? Being there's no further discussion, we'll move forward with the vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. All right. We're going to move on to um, information proposals and communications. Any, um, any updates on items A through G, or would you guys like to skip to H, board committee's discussion? I just wanted to put out the reminder that the NC, which is the Education Foundation, has the Night at the Races tomorrow night. So if anybody is looking for something fun to do, Night at the Races supports the Education Foundation. And it sounds like it's super fun. So that's technically not committee, so I'll bring that up. I would, I would like to uh, uh, wish the Cooper girls uh, good luck tonight. They probably are playing, I think they're playing right now or will be in, in a few minutes at the Sweet 16. Uh, I believe they're playing Danville Christian tonight and hopefully they can win. If they win tonight, they will play tomorrow night at 8.30 down at Rupp Arena. So good luck to the Cooper girls basketball team. Oh yeah, they're, they're playing in half an hour uh, down there. So I also, also wish them luck as a Cooper student myself. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a great team. If you haven't had a chance to watch them, they, they are fantastic. And I had another reminder. The Ed Foundation Night at the Races, even if you can't attend, you can still bid on items that will benefit the students in your backyard. So just a reminder, it's an amazing event. So 
and kudos to Cooper. And thanks to Long Branch. Watching those little kids line up is the best ever. They did it for football. They did it for basketball. These kids are like the biggest supporters in the world. So it's amazing. If you haven't seen the video, you should look it up. All right, anyway, um, there was uh, some recommendations made by uh, Mrs. Wolf uh, in regard to committees, and then I, we had discussed uh, reassigning committee assignments um, this month so some of the committees could finish their business. And I know all, um, Ms. Young and I serve on the negotiation committee, which, w which I think we'll meet one more time, and I'm assuming you and I want to be there for that one, but then the next group can start after that, which I don't know if there's any more business after that, because we've we've now one of the longest uh, discussions have have gone on this recent negotiation, right? And um, so it, we're just going to see that through if the if the other board members don't mind. I would like to ask for the same for the fees committee too, because we're wrapping that up and. I when, think we've when, got one more meeting on that. When will it be wrapped up? Mr. McCarr. Next meeting is uh, Thursday, the 21st. Okay. So, so if we started the committees in April, would that, would that be appropriate for everybody that has unfinished business in a committee? I mean, you, some of us will probably still be on the same committee. But yeah. I don't know. I, Dr. Detwater, I was going to ask you about teaching and learning and those types of committees. Okay, got it, all right. Ms. Wolf? Um, well, I passed out um, a thing a couple months ago and those were just ideas. They weren't anything I'm like married to, but I also sent you guys something that I just pulled up through chat GPT since I learned how to use it. <laughs> so it, I think that we just need to look at our committee structure and determine if it's meeting our needs as a board um, based off of our responsibilities. If we feel that the existing structure does, then... When you say structure, what, what do you mean? Just the committees that we have. Like, I believe I, one of the big ones was combining um, health and wellness and making it a um, student services committee with a discipline committee, health and wellness and the discipline committee and making it a student services committee. That was one of the big ones. And then adding a technology steering committee was another one I asked about that in the fall. So those are the two big ones that I think are needed out of all of the ones I submitted. So, Well, let's, let's talk about <clears throat> the health and wellness. I think um, Dr. Brown may be able to correct me if I'm wrong. That's a committee that was around during pandemic is that correct that was then changed to health and wellness is that correct yeah uh, there was a point where we had a committee where we could have representation from all as many groups that could meet online as possible and then it kind of blended into we, we moved from that to vaping and then mental health and mm -hmm. we've kind of targeted different priorities based on what Kathy and her team typically see as some of our priority priority needs in the district so um, there's always going to be a need so whatever allows us to do that most effectively well, I'm sitting on both of those committees right now, and I'll, I'll say that they both go hand in hand. A lot of the same conversations, especially when you're that talking was be mental my health. Next question for you, yeah, because yeah. I haven't sat on that committee. So the dis the, the discipline co that's more of an ad. That's a code committee. of conduct committee. No, is it is it a board committee or is that a district group? It was a we co we created the board committee as a discipline committee, but it morphed into the code of conduct. 
Is that yeah, correct? we've always had the code of conduct that kind of is reverse of what we thought. We yeah, had. yeah. We had the discipline committee that we had it. We formed as an ad hoc, and we've always had the code of conduct that Kathy has chaired. So that's always been around. Yes. And, and so we so just kind of blended it. We did. Yes, you're correct. Mm -hmm. But code of conduct is technically a district committee. Yeah. That's it's not a board committee. It's a correct. district committee. Yeah. Yep. What, what about this discipline committee? Is that the same thing? Well, the discipline committee, we kind of dissolved. It oh, was okay. in, I got you. And kind of put that into the code of conduct. Yeah. Because right. we were talking about the same things. <laughs> so, I, and again, I think that's where, you know, this conversation, um, we can do what we want with our board committees. Mm -hmm. um, but the district committees are formed and assigned by the superintendent. So I if don't. they want to have, I mean, I, if we're the code of con, is the code of conduct committee a board committee? No. 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 Okay. No. Well, actually, on my notes it says discipline committee, but that's I was just explaining the right. Right. evolution or. <laughs> okay. And I'm I'm ass, I'm assuming everyone, well, I shouldn't assume. The health the health and wellness committee is doing some great work with uh, the vaping situation and some other stuff and mental health, and mental health right. right? It uh, it initially was the, co the COVID committee and it kind yeah. of went from the COVID to like Maria was talking about into the health and wellness, which we did deal with vaping and mental health issues uh, that are around us and working in that area. But I think that really was a district committee too that just yeah, it had, was that Dr. Brown served on because of her area of, of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. I think we made that. I thought it was formed as a board committee yeah, back then. In the first. Oh, okay, maybe so. Maybe the year before. I, I wish, I'm sorry, I didn't bring my board committee mm -hmm. worksheet. Um, As far as your your other recommendations, are there any that you want to? The technology committee, um, I've, I've seen that in various different districts as well. So that's how my whole journey with this started was looking at other school districts that were that hired superintendents that used those companies that we were looking at. And I would just happened to go down the rabbit hole of their committee structures. And a lot of them, if not all of them, had some kind of a technology steering committee. And I thought that's something I brought up in the fall. So, do we have a district technology committee? Okay. That's what I want. I just want to make sure we aren't overlapping and doing the same thing where more administrators will be in more meetings on more evenings to do the same thing that they already did at the district level. So, Maybe a list of district versus board committees would be helpful so that we know what is what are the district committees, what's their charge, and then what are the district committees and what are their charges. Because what I, don't, I just don't want us to create committees that you're already doing so that you can duplicate your work because that would not be good. Yeah, we don't want that. But I, I do think that it's important that we're sitting on committees that actually reflect what we're supposed to be doing so we can hear conversations that are happening in real time. I do know that the District Code of Conduct Committee did kind of cover the technology that goes into like the technology portion of the Code of Conduct. Uh, Ms. Rankin, I believe, is the one who's in charge of that. She kind of brought a, like a new portion of what she wants put into the Code of Conduct regarding technology, so I'm not sure uh, if that would differentiate from just regular technology to what the district has like as a policy. Well, I, I don't have what you gave us before, Carolyn. I didn't have time to go home and get it before uh, I came here after work. But I guess my concern is um, some of the committees and what you were putting forward as ideals for those committees just seem to be straying out of our role and our responsibility. Um, we are not the nuts and bolts of how the district operates. That's the district. Um, 
we set the policies, we determine, you know, they determine the procedures in the process. Um, and I, I think the technology is, is kind of there. That doesn't say that there can't be a better communication. Sometimes I think maybe we need things before we get them or maybe we need to be updated as the process is going. But statute is very, very clear on the roles and responsibilities of the board and the roles and responsibilities of the superintendent leading the district. And I think uh, with like your suggestion for an HR committee, absolutely not. I mean, that's just way overstepping our bounds in personnel. Um, and we also have discussed about transportation, no, uh, we need to keep the transportation committee as it is. I think that it would be too disruptive to the district and the, and the largest classified department that we've got. Um, and we've, we've tried other avenues, but since transportation always seemed to be where we needed to concentrate to, to work and function and, and listen, that's why it's always remained that way. Now, by calling it transportation, does it give an impression that we might be ignoring other classified? Probably to the other classified that aren't in, in transportation, but the classified working group is working to take care of that. And the last thing that we need to do in a district this size with so much going on is get outside of our role and our responsibility and duplicate efforts. It's, we just don't, that's just not an efficient way to run a district this size. It's just my personal opinion. Um, I'll, <clears throat> I'll say that, you know, these, these types of recommendations, um, out of the box thinking and, um, those kind of things are, I, I welcome um, that type of creativity. I think it's a positive thing. Not to discount anything you said, because I, uh, I agree with it. So let's talk about, very specifically, um, the, board, the Board of Education Committees. And I th we might have to delay until we get some more information. Is the Health and Wellness a board committee? Yes. I'm pretty sure it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do we have a board committee that deals with code of conduct? We have the discipline committee, but it doesn't, it didn't necessarily deal with code of conduct. Or dis, well, that, to me, that's the same. Discipline, code of conduct. We, we started it last year. Was it ad hoc or was it an official? It was an ad hoc it was, committee. It was ad okay. hoc. All right. We're going to get it, <laughs> work through this. Is there, is there any interest um, to have uh, a board committee that, ha because of various legislation that happened last year with um, discipline matters, code of conduct, all those, and then also health and wellness? Um, having either the charge of the Health and Wellness Committee encompass some of this discipline and code of conduct, or, and we could keep the same name, just change the committee charge. Is there any interest from anyone up here that would widen the scope of health and wellness to include anything related to discipline? Code of conduct, discipline, whatever. Well, I would look over to the table over here. <laughs> for those that would have to lead it. I mean, Carolyn, I think you have merit in saying getting away from health and wellness, discipline, whatever, more for a student services committee, which could encompass whatever needs to be done. But.
is format. specified, it has to, uh, we have to review our code of conduct every two years. Now our board can ask that the code of conduct be brought to them annually, which is what we do with that. And that outlines all the guidance and responsibilities and um, guidance for what we can, we do for our discipline work. And we work, we're working with that to make sure that we're relating that to our MTSS work. LSS. Right. Yeah, I, I don't have any argument with code of conduct in and of itself should be at the district level because of statute and yes. your your antsy, you're shaking your head. We have legal confirmation of that. So, I, I, but I, I think there could be merit in a discussion of would a student services committee be beneficial and what would that be? Is that a fair question? That's a fair question. If we're looking at that being uh, all components such as mental health, uh, health, and um, any other kinds of situations that come up in student services, absolutely. But what would worry me about not having a mental health task force is we have some, sometimes 15, sometimes 30, community partners in that. So and they, can, and that was all, all around mental health. That's is the mental health task force, we have to be very, I, That's for me, right. please. Begin. Is the mental health task force the same as the health and wellness committee? No, no. the health okay. and wellness committee. Just, because I think what we're talking about is the committee specifically. I don't yes. think we would do anything. Your task force is doing great work. That's more of a district yes. Yes. initiative as well. Yes. So yes. that's over yeah so if, if I'm hearing every well Mrs. Bird and reading what Mrs. Wolf had given us would is there any interest to change the charge of health and wellness to include or change the name to student service committee I do, what I don't want to do is add more committees. I've already done that to you guys already, and I feel bad about it, um, and made you show up and everything. And, and uh, I'm not saying it's not effective and, and we've done great work and all that, but I, I, I don't want to add, but there are things that the board would like to discuss further on certain subjects. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that the board um, members have an opportunity to participate in those, those discussions, even, you know, so one of the things that, that we can do here um, is if, if, if and, I, and I'm not on the health and wellness committee, so if I'm speaking out of turn, let me know, but the health and wellness committee could be expanded to include student um, services or we call it student services so it has a wider scope, not affecting anything um, mental health task force wise. This is just at the board level. Okay. Um, is that something, Ms. Wolf, that you would want to see? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. I'm just, all right, I'm on the right track. Yes, right? The creating okay. a student service committee that kind of, and we can dissolve the ad hoc committee officially, the discipline ad hoc committee, and that can go underneath student services. What would that entail? What would student services entail? What I put in here was Health and wellness issues, discipline issues, incorporate student services, family resource, youth service centers, and stuff like that. So things that pop up, wide variety. What did you say? And then let, oh, I was just reading that. Special education. Oh, are you looking at the? <coughs> Typically, the board, if, I, if I'm, Correct, the board sets the specific charge, is that correct, for each committee? Really, the committee sets their the own. The committee sets system. the charge, okay. So. Based upon the intent of the board in creating or Roger. the committee, right? Correct. Just, just to make sure we're all on the same page, so there is a formal board procedure on this point. It is 1.411 AP.1. Um, and the committees are supposed to be instructed by the board the purpose to be served the length of each time or the length of time each member is being asked to serve 
resources the board will provide, and the date that you wish to receive any kind of reports from this group. But purpose to be served is the number one thing that you do have to, dis to discuss and instruct your committee on what their purpose is per board policy and procedure. Focus on matters related to student well-being and support services. So I think what we're having here is just a general discussion. This, the board, I don't think, will take any action changing any committees tonight unless someone wants to make some official recommendation or a motion to amend the agenda and all that and propose the things. Because I went through that already a couple of months ago, if you guys, I'm sure you guys all remember that. If, if you want to take formal action, you know, this is kind of a tricky situation because this is one of the very few things that is explicitly and exclusively within the prerogative of the board. Right. So if you wanted to amend the agenda, I'm not going to put too much of a please don't do that, fight up, you're not gonna hear that from me. But the safest course of action would be to add this to the next agenda as a formal board item. Right. So for now, um, if just as general consensus, is everyone okay with rethinking the health and wellness committee and including student services and waiting until we see some specific language from Mrs. Wolf and maybe if um, Dr. Burr, since you've sat on that committee for a long, long time, could maybe participate in thinking what or or whatnot. Did you call her Dr. Burr? I'm sorry, is it Dr. Brown. I'm looking right at it too. I'm looking right at it. Do we need to turn That's, our name tags around so you can see? Them? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am I am honored to be called a doctor, but I'm nowhere near that. Um, It's been a day, Jesse. I know. It has been a day. I was really hoping to get out of here by 8 30. If I could, uh, uh, right. if I could say one thing about the, this proposed student service uh, committee. My only concern is if it's about student services, I would like there to be students on this committee and somehow you know, put their voice in. Don't know if it had to be directly in person or somehow indirectly. But from my understanding, the, right now, the Health and Wellness Committee is one of the AM committees that happens during school hours. And so my question is, how could we allow students to have an active voice as they're the ones who, you know, the, the district should serve? And how can we implement, you know, students to attend that and, you know, be a vocal part of that committee if that is explicitly about student services? Fantastic question. What about Ms. Wolf? <laughs> <laughs> I can meet whenever. So I can, I can meet in the afternoons or whatever, but it's... Yeah, but some of us can't. So, I mean, in some of these committees, I've never served on. I've never gotten to be on teaching and learning in 30 years. I mean, we haven't had teaching and learning for 30 years, but, you know, because they meet during the day. And then you've got the concerns about taking students out of class and losing seat time, but you also don't want them at a 7 o'clock meeting on a school night either. So, yeah, that, that's, that's tricky. Oh, Mr. Dr. Detwell. Well, I was just going to say to connect with you, it's called teaching and learning, and we don't have teachers on that committee. So maybe looking at, you can bring, bring up a complaint, maybe we need to look at each committee and find out when it makes sense <coughs> to, to really meet. If it hasn't made any sense to me that we don't have any teachers on teaching and learning all these years. No, it's, it's always a, been administrators. Yeah, right. I mean, who are all, at one point, former educators, but, yeah. you know, but, uh, so, yeah. So it might make sense to look at each committee and really start thinking All right, well, anything else? Um, well, one of the big things that I get asked a lot from my constituents and I wanted to bring up and discuss is streaming committee meetings like we do our board meetings. Well, I can tell you, um, for me, it's probably just because of it being me but when I am in committees, sometimes it's hard to get upfront and honest answers from district employees on certain subjects because I'm there. I can only imagine if you're talking about a sensitive subject like employment or you know, uh, divisive issues or anything like that, if you expose that to now 
and these were just ideas, there are no decisions or anything like that, but if you expose people's ideas to YouTube, and then they are confronted with those by, the, by our community, I don't think we're gonna have a safe place to share those creative ideas on any particular subject if it's broadcast um, like our board meetings are. So that would be my concern. And then there's also the logistical part where we have to, I think there's some legality about keeping the data and storing that information, I think. So it's different from this meeting. It's different. Okay. Yeah. With well, that being said, I have talked to um, <coughs> Ms. Ashley about maybe streamlining, standardizing the minutes of committee meetings to make sure that they all meet a, a certain um, standard, I guess, and communicate, maybe convey a little bit better what might have went on in the committee meeting. Because I do believe, as our city councils in Boone County do, that people do read the min minutes of these meetings, especially the ones that aren't. We're one of the most open government bodies in Boone County. Um, and so to take that one step further, if we had a standardized minutes process for committees, I know that puts a little burden on the, the person that's taking the minutes and I apologize for that. But I think we would get more participation, more free thought and sharing in committee meetings um, if they weren't exposed to their peers, to the, pu the population, the public, whatever it is. I just would hate to stifle, stifle any conversation or idea sharing. And I, I, don't, I may be the only one that feels that way, but that's, that's what No, I, mean. I agree with that 100%. And I think, too, you have to remember a, a board committee is not the board. The, that's, there's only two members. That's for a reason. Any more is a quorum. We all know that now. So, um, and I think it's, it's a working group. It, you're working in draft format, basically. <laughs> Nothing is set in stone, and and you're right. the be The best way to stifle a conversation, I think, amongst probably teachers, is for the principal to walk into the room. At the district level, it's for a board member to show up, and you know, on down the line. Um, and I think that if we're going to say we want to include everybody and we want to give them a, a, a way to share their voice, and then, oh yeah, by the way, we're gonna record everything you say and throw it on YouTube. You're gonna have people drop off of committees and they're not gonna come. Or they're gonna sit there, even worse, they'll sit there and they'll show up and they'll never say what they feel because they don't feel safe to do that. So I would be opposed to that. I would and I think we can better communicate what happens in the committees after the fact um, as long as it's done accurately, um, and I mean, Katrina at KSBA would tell you in minutes less is more. I mean, if you look at our KSBA minutes, they're very, very dry. It's the motion, who seconded, the act, and what was the final action taken? Did it pass or did it not pass? There's not a lot in there at all about who said what when because what really mattered is what was the recommendation what was the final vote that's what is because anything in between can become subjective of the note taker right. so and I would agree I know some of the most impactful committees that I have been on I think of some of the ones I've been on with Kathy some of the most authentic vulnerable just the way that they shift the way you see the world, those conversations would not have happened if we were like, hey, by the way, you're gonna bear your soul, we're all gonna be crying, and we're gonna put on YouTube. I just think that we would have missed those opportunities to build authentic relationships with some of those committee members or task force members, whatever it may be. Um, that's just my opinion. Well, I will say along the same lines, you brought up something that uh, we had also uh, discussed, and that is, I, I think it's possible Ms. Wolf shares this um, <coughs> opinion of mine, that sometimes when, when the board is sitting in the committee um, and an idea is brought to the, that committee 
there's discussion, maybe some, sometimes not very much discussion, and then it's on the agenda for the next month, which is how it's supposed to work. The board, the, the committees produce items for the board. What I, what I would like is if we could agree that there should not, not a recorded vote like Eric this and Jesse that, but uh, at least a yay and nay. How many people on the committee wanted to advance this to the board? A lot of the committees I've sat on is just uh, everyone <coughs> came to that, and then you see a bunch of people that don't say anything, and then you know how this works. About a week later, you know, people that were on the committee now are saying things. You know, so just to make sure that there's an affirmation to move that to the board. Would that be an acceptable guideline for our board committees? Okay. Is that okay? All right. Just a total of them. That's all. Like we, you know. What else you got? All right. Well, we look forward to seeing um, the, your proposal for the health and wellness if, if you do get that to me. All right. Uh, anything else in the information proposals and communications? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. If you guys could let me know which committees that we have currently and that you want to sit on. Yeah. I thought I was going to write that down tonight, but we didn't, I didn't bring my notes. How do you want us to let you know, like, do you want us to give you our availability or how do we want to do that? I think what we've done in the past is just which ones would you like? And I'll, I'll do that matching game and see <laughs> which, you know. But it is a good point though that some of the board members since you know, like the like Mrs. Bird um, this <laughs> described as you know some of the the board if the committee meets at eight nine o'clock ten o'clock eleven o'clock in the morning it limits some availability of some of the board members so yeah I, I'll always consider that right right. I, I do appreciate, though, um, this particular board, um, because I do believe that every member of this board is um, extremely active and um, active in their committee committees that they're assigned to, and generally shares the information that comes out of those committees pretty well. And so I'm I personally. Um, I commend my, my fellow board members for that, and sometimes it's a lot. And uh, but I, I I'm I think that this particular board is going to work well the rest of the year uh, with committees, and we'll get the other things set up, and we'll, we're going to do some great um, some great things in those committees. So I look forward to it. All right, uh, it, we're going to move on to item 12, which is closed executive session for KRS 61. Point eight one zero. There's no closed session. Move to item agenda item twelve. Uh, I just said that. Sorry. We will move now to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Second. Uh, Young. Second, Miss Young. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Aye. Okay. Second.